All right, let's do this. Uh, it's week eight and it's Wednesday, and we've got a couple more lectures left, and then we can go have a week off with our families or whatever it is that you're going to do for the break. Uh, I know we're all looking forward to it. Um, we're going to continue talking about graphs today. Last time we talked about just general concepts and terminology, reasons why you might be motivated to care about graphs, that sort of thing. Uh, and we played around with the basic graph class that comes with the C++ libraries. Uh, one thing I was going to mention about that class, about that basic graph that we programmed with, is that actually if you look at a lot of programming languages, you will find that they do not have a class representing a graph. They don't have basic graph or they don't have anything equivalent to that. In fact, uh, I think I mentioned at the start of this class that most of the Stanford uh, uh, libraries that we were learning are equivalent or similar to these STL libraries that come with C++. Like we have our vector, the STL also has a vector. You know, we have uh, the map, and STL also has a map. And so most of the things we're doing with these Stanford collections are equivalent to something that really comes with C++. Uh, the basic graph is not equivalent to anything in the STL. And I'll probably talk more about that on Friday. But basically, the long story short on that is that graphs are, are, are complicated, and they're varied, and there's lots of different types of graphs. And it's hard to write one graph library that works for all of them. And so most languages don't even try. Um, but anyway, whatever, we tried and we wrote one and it sort of works. And uh, so where we left off last time was we were talking about these path searching algorithms. How do you find a path in a graph? We talked about one called depth first search. Could just somebody give me like a kind of a one sentence description of how a depth first search works? What do you say? Uh, you basically go as far as you can in the graph not looking at any previously visited points until you hit a dead end and then you backtrack Yeah, that's right. If you're trying to find a path from A to B, you pick a neighbor of A and you go as far down that direction as you can and see if you can get to the destination B. And if you do, then you stop. And if not, you backtrack, you try something else. That's just what you said. So, and again, you, you sort of explore deeply down that one path. You choose that one neighbor um, here. You choose a neighbor and you try to explore whether you can get from that neighbor to the destination point B2. So what that means about depth first search is that you are not guaranteed to find the best path, the shortest path, the path with the least weight on the edges. None of those things are guaranteed. But it will find, if there is a path in the graph from that start to that end, you will find it eventually. So that's good, I guess. Um, the depth first search uh, is not very hard to implement, relatively speaking. And it doesn't require that much data and that much complexity to do. So it's, uh, it's sort of a simple path searching algorithm. That's the main benefit of it. So I want to resume from there. I want to talk about, oh, uh, one other thing I want to mention is um, sometimes after you're done with the DFS, the depth first search, you say, OK, well, I found a path. Great. The path is found. Yay. But like, what is the path? Like, how, you know, I need to know what nodes to visit in order to follow the path, right? So like, how would I write a version of this that like told me what the path was? Well, this is a recursive backtracking exercise like you guys said on Monday. So when you do recursive backtracking, how do you know, I mean, these, these vertexes that you're choosing, right? Like how do we know what the algorithm has chosen to present it to the user when we're done? Just in a general case. Yeah? Well, since we're keeping track of what nodes we've already visited anyway, so we don't hit the same ones when we reach the end. The least of the list of all the nodes that we've visited is the list, is the path that we want to do. Yeah, so these nodes that we're visiting, if we could just remember all of the nodes that we have visited, then that's our path basically. Or, or yeah. So um, in terms of some of the mechanics of it in C++, maybe you could pass along a collection of such things. So you pass along some sort of uh, it's, this is pseudocode, but like you might pass along a vector or something as another parameter. We did this with backtracking, right? You pass along your choices that you've made and stuff, right? So pass along some vector that's your path, and then when you mark people as visited, add them to that vector. And then if you uh, you know find a path, hooray! Well, then it's in your vector now. But if you don't find a path, maybe you unchoose by removing it from the path. So yeah, that's the basic idea. 
I'm being a little more uh, vague and pseudocody about this, just in case, hypothetically, if you had to implement this, maybe. Uh, I don't want to give away all of it, right? But that's the general idea. Um, okay, so I already talked about this. Uh, this is kind of summary of DFS. It finds a path, it doesn't find the best path. Now, I want to move on to another path searching algorithm, and I want to compare and contrast it to depth first search. This one is called breadth first search, BFS. So, I mean, just I think the name implies a little bit about the algorithm. It searches broadly instead of deeply. So uh, the general idea is that starting from your starting point, if you're trying to get to the destination point, you search out by one and look at everywhere that you can get to. And if you can't get to the destination, then you search out by two and see everywhere that you can get to. And if that doesn't get you to the destination, you just keep repeating this. You kind of widen your search radius by one over and over and over until you get to the goal. Now, that's, uh, that's not enough detail to implement an algorithm, but that's the idea, right? Um, so if you're trying to get from A to I, you would sort of look at all the immediate neighbors of A and just see if any of them was I. And if it was, then um, you're done. But otherwise, you sort of now start looking at all these people's immediate neighbors and see what they are. And so like, I'm just writing down over here what order the vertexes would get looked at in the algorithm. You sort of look at A, and then you look at BDE, and then their direct neighbors are GHF. And uh, then eventually, once you look at the direct neighbors of them, you would get to uh, C or I, and you would, you would see I as the destination. And then you would stop, and you would find that path, ADHI. So breadth-first search. Uh, has some different attributes to it compared to depth first search. And one of the most important attributes of it is that it always returns the shortest path. Now, I mean, you, you should always be skeptical whenever I tell you something because, you know, for one thing, I don't know that much. And for another thing is I kind of like lying to you guys just to see if you'll fall for it, right? But like, so if I tell you something like that, I think you should always question me and say, well, how do you know that? You know, like, are you sure? Um, what would be your intuition that would convince you that I'm not lying to you, that it must really return the shortest path? How do you know that that's true? Yeah? Because when it's searching for a path, it's basically finding all other possible shorter paths. As in, like, in depth first search, it's possible to skip a shorter path. But in here, you can't, because you're going down each level. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, if you take 103 or some of our theoretical courses, you learn about proof techniques. Like, how do you prove things in a way that's logically sound? And a common uh, way of proving things is by contradiction, right? So you sort of say, well, imagine that this didn't find the shortest path. Imagine that there's a shorter path than the one that was found by this. What would have to be true about that path? And so on. And you sort of make it clear that that would be a contradictory state, that that couldn't be. And the sort of the idea of the contradiction here is that you look at all the paths of length one first, right? And if any of them gets you to the target, you stop. And we didn't stop, so we go on to the paths of length two, and we look at all of them. And if any of those get us to the destination, we stop. And if they don't, we go on to the paths of length three. So we get to path of length seven, and we find the destination. And then you're wondering, well, is there a shorter one? No, because we checked literally all of the shorter paths before. You know what I mean? Like, we would have found it. So the algorithm wouldn't do that. So anyway, that, that's the idea, right? It finds the shortest possible path in the graph between those two vertexes. So now in terms of how to implement this, uh, you can't literally look at all three of these one element jumps all at once, but you sort of can order in what order you're gonna look at things. So the general algorithm looks like this. If you're looking for a path from B1 to B2, you have kind of a to-do list, a few of things that you're gonna look at. Initially, your to-do list is vertex one, the starting point. So you repeat until the queue is empty. You pull out the front element from the queue. You mark that element as being visited. And then you insert all of that element's uh, neighbors into the queue to be processed later. And you repeat until what pops out of the queue is the destination. So I mean, you might say, that doesn't sound like what you said on the last slide. But if you just think about the effect of that code, it will be what I said on the last slide. It'll be the first thing that will ever pop out of this queue will be the starting point. The next things that will pop out of this queue will be the neighbors, the immediate neighbors of the starting point. And the next things after that will be all these people's neighbors that got in after, and so on and so on. 
And so this algorithm will, will implement a breadth first search. Now last time when we talked about depth first search, I said, hey, doesn't this look familiar? And uh, somebody in the room said, well, that looks like a backtracking algorithm, right? So does this look familiar? Where have you seen this before? The word ladder program. This is exactly what you're doing in the word ladder program. It's literally the same algorithm. You put the, the little stack with just the starting word into a queue, and then you repeatedly pull a stack out, put all the neighbors on top of that stack, and put all those neighbory stacks onto the queue, right? You, that's exactly what you did. You did this. You just didn't do it as a graph problem, but you used the same algorithm. So, uh, and and if, assuming that you got that program to work, I think you know that, that you found the shortest word ladders between the two words, right? So that, that was a graph searching problem, basically. And of course, if that were a graph, the vertexes would be the words, and the edges would be if they differ by one letter. If they're neighbors, then there's an edge between them, right? So that's a graph of data. So yeah, that's how to implement a breadth first search. Um, so I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. That's kind of the main idea here. Now, I think the main thing that, like when I was a student, when I learned breadth first search, I was like, it seems like that's better than that other one. Why, why would you ever want depth first search? It doesn't find a short path. It finds a long, weird path. Why won't you just use this all the time? Um, and I mean, I think it's a reasonable question to ask, but I guess the short answer would be like, sometimes you don't care if it's the shortest path. And sometimes this could take longer just because it has to manipulate its queue and NQ, DQ, all these different things. It might take more memory to run this. It might take more time to run this. Maybe the benefits of this are not important to me in the context of my problem that I'm trying to solve. Uh, you might say, why would you ever not want the shortest path? Well, sometimes the length of path doesn't matter. Like, if you're trying to connect a power grid to a city, make sure every house has power, then, you know, <laughs> pretend it's a graph. The houses are vertexes and the power cables are the edges, right? And it doesn't really matter if you have a short power cable connecting to your house or a long one. I mean, I guess if it were really long, it's maybe dangerous or something, but, but like, <laughs> yeah, in general, as long as you're connected, you're connected. So I just want to make sure that they're all connected. I don't care if it's short, you know? So you don't always want the benefit of this over uh, DFS. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what's the point of marking them as visited? Is that just so we don't want to the same right? Uh, the reason we mark them as visited <laughs> is because we only want to look at the unvisited neighbors here. And I think you did this in the word ladder. In fact, some of you might have had this bug where you didn't do the, you had to keep like a set of what words you had already seen before. Remember this? You did this in word letter. And as you looked at words, you put them in there. And if you didn't do that set or forgot to put things into that set, I think you probably found that your algorithm took like forever and it never stopped, right? You guys ever have that bug? So um, yeah, I mean, basically, a lot of these algorithms will say, do this to every unvisited uh, vertex. Yeah, this is to make sure, because a lot of graphs have these cycles where if you go around this way and come back around, you can get where you started again. You don't want the graph like spinning around looking for something. Um, yeah. Is DFS, um, can you introduce like randomness to it, and would that still be DFS, or is DFS always consistent every time you run it? Oh, DFS, if yeah. you can <coughs> randomly pick which way to go? Yeah. It's still DFS. I mean, uh, I think what you'll find is if you implement DFS and DFS using our libraries, you'll get a consistent result. But the reason it's consistent is just because our graph gives you back the neighbors in alphabetical order usually. Um, but yeah, if you took those neighbors and shuffled them up in a different order and then processed them, you'd get different results different times you ran uh, the path search, but it would still be a, a DFS or a BFS. It wouldn't change the nature of the search. I mean, you might find that your DFS happens to pick the best path and returns the shortest one, but it would only be by, by happenstance, you know? <coughs> so, uh, you know, in general, whenever you implement these things, you probably want to know what the path is. And just like with DFS, so DFS, the way we figured out what the path is, is that we pass out along a vector and we put the visited vertexes into a vector. You can't really do that same exact trick here because kind of conceptually speaking, you're technically trying a bunch of paths a little bit at a time. As opposed to DFS, you're exploring one path as far as possible and then backing out. So you can represent that one and only path as a vector. In this case, so, I mean, look, what we did to remember the path in the word ladder was you kept this ridiculously elaborate structure with like a queue full of stacks of words and letters and like, it's kind of a silly structure. You had all these queues and stacks all over the place and that was because each of those stacks was representing a like partial exploration that you were looking at, a path. 
And then once you found the target, you said, oh, well, then this is the chosen stack. Here's the stack of all the words, right? Um, that works fine, except it takes a lot of memory. So we had you do that on assignment two because that's like the best we could get at that point. But what, mostly what you would do if you had a nice graph library like this is <coughs> instead of keeping a queue of stacks or a queue of vectors or whatever, you would just, every time you visit a vertex, every time you like mark it as being visited, you would also remember like, how did I get to this vertex? So if I mark, you know, if I do A first in my queue and then after A I do B, D, E, I would sort of somehow remember that B and D and E all came from A. So I'd store like a previous node, a previous pointer, a previous something that would represent A. So then eventually, if I ever get to the target, like A to I is what I'm searching for, then I would have memory that I's previous was H, and H's previous was D, and D's previous was A. So then if I want the path from A to I, once I find I, I just go previous, 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 and that's, that's my path. It's backwards, but that's the path, right? Um, now, if there are equally good paths, there are two of the same minimum length, this algorithm will find one of them, and it doesn't matter that one of them's not any better or worse than the other. So I think it'll just find the alphabetically least of the best paths. Yeah. So uh, uh, where is previous stored? Mm. Mm. Yeah, so like where is the previous stored? I mean, it kind of depends what library that you're using, but basically you need some way of asking who is the previous of that guy. So, I mean, that could literally, if you don't have a lot of support for that, that could literally be like, a map of vector or vertex to vertex or something. You know, like, it, it could be anything. Or if your library is helpful, maybe it lets you set, hey you, your previous is you, and maybe it lets you somehow store that in the graph object in some way, depending on what the library gives you. So yeah, I mean, but just in an abstract sense, you need to come up with a way to remember that. For a given vertex, I want to remember who their previous is in some form, right? That could be a map of strings to strings, or it could be a map of vertex star to vertex star or something like that, you know? Okay? So that's the idea. And the same thing for, uh, you know, when I talk about marking a vertex as visited, the same concept applies there. Like, how do you mark a vertex as visited? What does that mean? Well, I don't know, like make a set of things that are visited and put it in the set. You know, like you come up with a way to make that so, right? Like the, the graph doesn't magically do that for you. Like you do it, you know? figure out a way to remember that you visited this vertex before, however that is, right? Okay. So that algorithm mostly makes sense. Any questions about BFS? Could you create a struct that contains like a visited variable or attribute? Sure, I, th I think if you have design control over the graph library, you could say, I want my vertexes to have a little Boolean flag inside of them or something, visited, true, false, or something, and I'll turn it to true. So yeah, I mean, if you have the ability to decide those things, then you can make your library help with this kind of stuff. I, I think the one thing I want to be careful about is like, looking for a path is one of a billion things you might want to do with a graph. And it's not the only thing you might want to do. So like, if you over customize your graph library to be good for path searching, it might not be as good for something else, or it might be bloated or whatever. So like, it depends what you want to do. In fact, uh, if you want me to digress for just a second, like I, I did a job interview once uh, where, uh, you know, I was interviewing for a, a, an industry job at Microsoft and the, they, you know, they ask you these, these coding questions and puzzle questions and stuff and the guy said like, I want you to write a graph library or at least tell me the design of how you would write a graph library. Like what methods would it have and what would it do and stuff and I started like writing down all these method headers and stuff and then at some point I stopped and I was like, oh wait, actually, um, what are you going to do with the graph? Because, you know, do I need a Boolean for visited? Do I need a map of uh, previous? You know, like, what are you going to do with it? Because I guess that, that, whether I'd use this or this or this, depends on what you're going to do with it. And he said, okay, that's the right answer. Let's move on. <laughs> so, <laughs> all he wanted me to say was, what are you going to do with the graph? Because then it, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, uh, I should have just asked him that, and then I wouldn't have had to know the answer. Um, was there another hand up, somebody? Yeah. You don't need the previous uh, for a DFS because if you pass along a vector, like your recursion call stack, kind of is your your path of where you where you're looking, and like if you store in a vector like where you are visiting along your current recursion calls, then if you find the target, that vector has your path, and if you don't find the target, you just unchoose and remove from the vector on the way back out, and so. 
the different, the reason you do that there and this here is because there you're, you're exclusively exploring one path all you can until you give up. And so therefore that one path can be in a vector somewhere or whatever. But this, you're sort of implicitly a little bit exploring lots of paths one step at a time. Therefore, you can't just have one path that you're keeping as a vector because you're doing like all of these a little bit. And so, you know what I mean? Like you can't just throw all of these paths into one vector together. Oh, the one question I had is that like you were saying that you can sort of map Well, uh, yeah, if you have multiple previous, but you, you don't in this algorithm because like in this algorithm, whenever you add somebody to the queue, it's as a neighbor of somebody else that you pulled out of the queue. So you're like, I got to him from him. So n's previous is b or whatever. So it's like, while it's true that there could be multiple, like you could have gotten to i from h or from c or from whatever, but I got to i from h. So like. That's what I will store. The other possible ways I could have gotten to I, I will not store those because that's not what my algorithm ran into. You know? uh, yeah. What if you wanted to return all the shortest possible paths? Because in the other algorithm, it was pretty easy to modify. You just don't stop looking. But in this one, you have no sense of how long your current path is. You want all the shortest possible paths? Yeah, I mean, that's. I think, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but, but basically, the, um, the short answer would be like, if you ever, I, I think actually what's missing from the pseudocode is like when do you stop? Like you stop if you see the target like B2 or whatever, right? But I think what you would do is like if you see B2, you, you celebrate and you give out your path for that with the previous pointers. But then after celebrating and printing that out or whatever, or returning or whatever it is you're doing, you don't immediately break out of your loop. You continue the loop until you have exhausted all the paths of the same length as that. But then once you get to the point where your path is longer than that, you would want to stop, you know? How do you so, know, since we don't, we only keep track of what node we're currently on and what its previous node was? Well, I mean, you'd have to decide that you want to modify the algorithm to remember maybe my previous is him, and the number of steps it took to get to me was two or three or whatever. You can, you can associate any vertex with any other piece of information you'd like with a map, basically. So I would have to map that I got to H in two hops and I got to I in three hops. So yeah, once you saw, saw a vertex that you got to using more than three hops, you would break out because you would say, I'm done with all the three, three hop uh, paths now, okay? All right, so that's BFS. Um, what else? I haven't talked about Big O. I'm gonna mostly talk about Big O on Friday, but most of these algorithms, uh, BFS and DFS, have a Big O that's proportional to the vertexes and proportional to the edges, linearly both. So we phrase that as saying it's Big O of V plus E. Uh, I don't want to go into a lot of justification of why that's the case yet. I want to save that, but like, that's what it is. We'll, we can talk more about that uh, later. I mean, this sort of intuition is that you don't visit a vertex multiple times, and you know, because you don't visit its neighbors multiple times, that also means you don't travel the edges more than once. So I mean, it's there's kind of an intuition to it that you visit things at most once. But anyway, whatever. Uh, I want to keep moving. I want to jump to my other slide deck, which is. There's still more algorithms for searching for paths. Uh, and I want to tell you about two more. I don't know if I'll finish all of them today, but I want to talk about one called Dijkstra's algorithm. And if we have time, I want to talk about one called A star. OK, so these algorithms are further improvements on breadth for search to try to make them run faster. Because you know the examples I've been showing you with these little graphs and A to B and B to C and all that stuff, those are very small graphs. I mean. What I have like eight or nine vertexes or something. Like if you had a graph of all the cities and all the roads, and you know you're trying to map the streets or something. Like there's a lot of vertexes and there's a lot of edges, and you zoom out and you have the whole USA. There's a ton of vertexes. Um, to say nothing of some of the other like social <laughs> network, these graphs with billions of people in them. You know it's too many vertexes. So these algorithms really need to go fast. And the ones I've been showing you are sort of fast, but maybe we can do better. So uh, there's another flaw with those algorithms. Besides that which is that they don't consider edge weight. The BFS is optimized to find the shortest path, which is great. But sometimes I don't want the shortest path. I want the one with the minimum total cost. And those are not always the same, right? So I think my example here is if you're going from A to F, then the shortest path is AEF, right? That's uh, two hops. And the cost of that path is seven plus two is nine but I think you can get there 
There's a couple ways you can get there for a lower cost, right? If you go A, B, E, F, that's four plus two plus two, that's eight, so it's one less. And I think, isn't it true, if you go all the way around the bottom, it's even cheaper than that, isn't it? Six or something? So like, there are cheaper paths that have more hops, and sometimes that's what you want, right? I mean, we've talked about some of these real world analogies, like it's airline tickets. <laughs> if you're willing to fly a four stop flight, which sounds like fucking horrible, but <laughs> if you're willing to do that for 600 bucks instead of a two stop flight for 900 bucks, well, you're a starving college student, you might take that deal, I don't know. Uh, you can think of lots of examples like that, right? So um, sometimes weight is important. Okay, so Dijkstra's algorithm is named for Edgar Dijkstra, who's a really cool dude. You should go look up his Wikipedia page or something. He, um, you know, I could go on about him. I, I, I'll just say briefly that uh, he's a very important figure in the history of computer science and logic. Um, and he... Um, you know, he came up with this algorithm, Dijkstra's algorithm, along with many other clever uh, computing solutions. Um, he was very influential in computational linguistics and also in um, uh, compilers, in operating systems, all kinds of areas of our field. Uh, brilliant dude. He won the Turing Award, which is like the Nobel Prize for computer science. Um, really cool dude. And uh, I like him because his name contains the for loop variables in a row, I, J, K. Um, I don't know, this is a cool, it's a cool property, you know? Um, he also almost single-handedly uh, killed the go to command, which was one of the worst things that ever happened to programming. Um, languages used to have this command called go to, where you could just jump to anywhere else in the program immediately. It's almost like calling a function, except you could just jump into the middle of a function or jump anywhere. You could just say, go to there. <laughs> now you're there. <laughs> um, and that was powerful, but it made debugging impossible because you had no idea where you came from and how you got here, and it just, it was bad. And he wrote this really <laughs> influential paper called, go to, consider it harmful. And once he said that, everybody was like, oh, he's right. And so they stopped. I mean, he, he didn't single-handedly kill GoTo. But anyway, that paper is super famous. Anyway, he, he's a very interesting dude who's done a lot in computer science. I don't usually talk about CS people, but he's, he's one of my guys. So um, he came up with this algorithm. And uh, you know, I think it's kind of funny because like, this is like where people in school first hear the name Dijkstra, you know? But it's like. This is probably like his 27th most important contribution to our field, you know what I mean? But whatever, this is what's named for him. Um, so this is an algorithm that finds a minimum weight path in a graph between two vertexes. Technically, you could find all the paths, but whatever. Um, the basic idea of this algorithm is it's a lot like a BFS, except you use a priority queue instead of a regular queue. Remember how we said we pull things in queues and we pull them out and look at them and stuff? Instead of doing a normal queue, we use a priority queue that is prioritized by edge weight. And if you do that and a little more magic, then basically you uh, end up finding the minimum weight path using the algorithm. Remember the logic I was talking about, about we know that breadth first search will find the shortest path because we look at all the shorter paths before we look at any of the longer paths, right? That's intuitively going to be the shortest path was found. This algorithm is kind of like that, except it looks at all the low cost paths before it looks at all the high cost paths. And therefore, if you ever find a path to the destination, you will know it's the lowest cost way to get there. I'll show it to you. So <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated pseudocode, but it's, it's not that bad, trust me. Um, so uh, Dijkstra's algorithm is you associate every <coughs> vertex with a cost. So we were talking about like how do you map to a previous and how do you remember a number of hops? You, you can have a map or whatever from vertexes to doubles or its or whatever costs, you know? So assume that every vertex has a cost and you start out where they all have a cost of infinity. That just means I don't have any way of, I don't know of any way to get to that vertex yet. So if I ever find a way, it'll be cheaper than infinity, right? That's the idea. Um, except the starting vertex, you're already starting there. So the cost to get there is zero. Now, you put all the vertexes into a priority queue. You guys know about priority queues, uh, patient queues, right? Like you know about that, so sort them kind of by priority. And initially, um, just put, uh, put V1 in there. And now this algorithm is basically the same as BFS. You pull out a vertex, mark it as visited, and then put his neighbors in there. The change, I mean, there's a lot of words here, but the change is that when you add things into the data structure, the PQ, 
you have to add the value that you're putting, like the vertex, and you have to add a priority. So like, what's the priority that you use? The priority that you use is the cost to get to the vertex you're currently looking at, which I've called V, plus the cost of the edge from V to the neighbor. So if I can get to V1 with a cost of zero, then the cost to get to the neighbors is their direct edge cost, and then the cost to get to all their neighbors is the first edge plus the second edge and so on. So you're storing kind of a sum of costs as the priority, and you guys remember that a PQ pops things out from the lowest priority number to the highest, and so the ones with the low cost are gonna come out of there first, and so we're gonna look at them first, and so we're gonna look at the cheaper paths first, and so on. That's the idea. And again, we have this idea of reconstructing a path using previous pointers that is borrowed from BFS. Once we find the target, we go previous, previous, previous until we find it back to the start. Now, I think it's easier with an example and a picture, so let's talk about that. The slides are all on the website. So if I'm looking for Dijkstra's algorithm path from A to F, you know, I, I remember all these guys have a cost of infinity, except my start <laughs> vertex has a cost of zero. I'm gonna have some color coding here on this diagram. I'm gonna put something yellow here if it's in the PQ that's gonna get looked at at some point. I'm gonna color it green if I pulled it out of the PQ and I marked it as visited already. That's gonna be green, okay? Uh, so initially, kind of when the algorithm starts up, you put the starting vertex in the PQ at a cost of zero. Okay, so that's sort of the state of things. And I'm looking for a path to F. So now the next step is you pull somebody out and you put all their neighbors in. So I pull A out mark him as visited, and then I put all his neighbors in the PQ, and the cost I put them in with, the priority I put them in with, is the edge weight from A to that person, right? So this guy's in with a two, and this guy's in with a one. So in the PQ, that's sorted, right? So the one with the one is gonna be in the front, so he's gonna come out first. Yeah? Wait, so what's the point of making everything else like uh, 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 with the cost of infinity? Why infinity? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just conceptually, like, if you're ever, if you, I mean, what we'll see in a second is sometimes you get to a vertex multiple ways and you want to know which way is better. And so you always want to know that, like, if you, if, if you haven't gotten there yet, then the, that way is infinitely bad, so you want anything else but that kind of, you know? So it's, I mean, you don't always have to literally store infinity in your code. It's just conceptually you think of it as, like, I don't know any way to get here, so I think of it as having infinite cost to reach or something. That's just, you know, it, I've seen you guys do this. Like you're trying to find the, the minimum thing. So you set it to it max value or whatever. It's that, it's that hack, you know, you're doing that, right? So, okay, put these guys in with the um, edge weight as the um, priority, right? So then we just repeat. So we pull somebody out. It's gonna be, uh, I know this is kind of on the bottom of the slide, it's hard to see, but a PQ has D in it uh, first because it's got the lowest cost. So I pull D out. And now a lot of stuff changed because I pulled D out, I mark him visited, and I mark all of his unvisited uh, neighbors. I put them all in, and the cost I put them in with is like his edge to get to him, his cost of one, plus the two, plus the eight, plus the four, plus the two. So like the C goes in with three, the E goes in with three, the F goes in with nine, and the G goes in with five, and it's, kind of, it's, it's sorted again like, like usual, right? Now you might say, wait, I saw F, I'm trying to find a path to F, so I said stop now, right? No, you don't stop until you pull F out of the PQ and mark him as visited, because if you stop now, you would choose ADF as your path, which we'll see is not the best choice. So, so like, you don't wanna stop yet if you see uh, F, right? So okay, that's the state of, of things now. And just by the ordering of the PQ, the now the cheapest one to look at is B with a cost of uh, two, right? So I pull him out and I look at all of his neighbors. His neighbors are D and E. And so even though I already have D and E, or I guess I already, I already uh, visited uh, D, but E is in the PQ. So then the question is, is it better to get to E through B than the way I did before? Like I already have seen him as one plus two, and he's in there with that as his weight, but now I found another way to get to him. If this new way of getting to him is better, then I might want to use that way. But in this particular example, it isn't. So it's like two plus 10, that's worse. So looking at B, I mark him as being visited, but it doesn't update anything else about the state of the um, algorithm here so far, right? Okay, but sometimes if you can find a cheaper way, it would update stuff. So okay, I checked B, so now next in the PQ would be C. 
So, so I, 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 I pop out C and I mark him as visited. Um, from C, I can reach F. I'm looking at the immediate neighbors of C now, right? I can reach F with a cheaper cost because previously I had F in there with a cost of nine coming from D. Do you see this? That's what my algorithm had found so far. So I have F with nine. <coughs> now that I'm looking at C, I can actually reach F that way with a cost of eight. So I go ahead and I update that in the PQ. I upgrade the patient from having a score of nine to a score of eight. <laughs> wax on, wax off, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's the same idea of like upgrading an element of a PQ, moving it to a better priority than it had before. F cost is now eight, okay? So now the next one that would come out of the PQ would be E off the front here, cost of uh, three. The neighbor of E is uh, G. And I think I had, what did I have a cost for G before was five. And I have an equal or a worse cost for that now. If I, if I had gone from E, it would be one plus two plus six. That's worse, so that doesn't update anything. Next on the PQ will be G. If I look at G, that actually updates my cost for F now because um, I'll go back again. F is in there with a cost of eight going this way, right? But if I add G and I, and I visit him, then I can get to G for a cost of one plus four equals five, and F for one more equals six. So now F gets updated to cost of six as previous. Do you see? So it's just like as you're going along, you're just sort of remembering the best way that you have seen to get to every vertex and where that was from, where you came from to get that best path. And so basically, at some point, when you finally DQ F, the destination, and you mark him as visited, you should be certain at that point, because of the properties of the <coughs> algorithm, that you have reached F using the lowest cost possible way. Yeah, question? Um, the effects of the algorithm might have negative weights, because I feel like it wouldn't go to a node that's already visited, even if it might like, reduce the weight to get there. Dijkstra's algorithm does not work if the graph has negative edge weights. It will, I believe it will work fine if you have zero weight edges, but negative weights <laughs> break the algorithm. You just can't, as a precondition, it assumes there are no negative weights. It won't work. Yeah. So, uh, uh, what if like uh, 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 like coming from G, you, you had like a, 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 you had a whole tree of like other nodes, which which like which like didn't connect back to F? Then would the algorithm have to like go through that whole? Like, if there's a bunch of crud over here that wasn't yeah. helpful, and the algorithm's like stuck over here looking at all this crud yeah. before it finds out. No, um, I think I mean maybe I should change these slides slightly because I think by the end of this, I've looked at every node. Yeah. But in another example, if there was crud, I wouldn't necessarily look at all of the nodes. Um, the order that you look at the nodes is relative to the weight. So like, if there's a node here that has a cost of three or whatever, then he'll get put in the PQ with one plus four plus three, and you won't pull him out unless that's the cheapest thing that you haven't looked at yet. So like, for example, at this point in the algorithm, F is in here with six, so he's like next to be looked at. So then I stop because I found him. But like, you know, what if there was some guy, you know, A cost one and then to E cost two more, so I've got three to get here. And then there was something else over here that had a cost of one. I would look at that, because that's cheaper. Because you never know, there could be cost of one to this guy followed by cost of one to F. I have to check for that, I have to look at that. But if this guy has like a cost of 12, it's gonna go in with a high PQ number and I'm not gonna see him until after F, he'll be over here. So I actually won't even see him because I'll see F, I found F, that's what I wanted, I just stop. So. <coughs> Basically, if there's crud over here, you'll only look at it if it's low cost crud, in which case you need to look at it. So if it's high cost crud, you will, it will not be seen. So, yeah. Oh, was there another question? Yeah. Yeah, what if you had um, the edge from A to B in class one, and from B to C cost one, and then from C to D cost two, so like. Okay, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I'm happy to answer this, but let me, let me do it live. Uh, We'll do it live. Uh, do you guys get that reference? Uh, a to B costs one. one. And then from B to C costs one. And then from A to D costs two. So like that's the only So what you would do is, if you, if when the algorithm started, you put A in with a cost of zero, so you didn't pull him out, mark him green, 
and then you would enqueue the neighbors, you'd enqueue B with one and B with two, and then you repeat your loop, and so you always grab the cheapest one out. So you look at B first, and you say, who are the neighbors of B? And you say, oh, I can get to D for a cost of two, but I already have D with a cost of two, so you would just leave it, you wouldn't change it, um, you would put D in with a cost of 11, but yeah, like you wouldn't change anything about D. Um, what you might do though is like if this were like a cost of four, yeah. So then like, you put him in with one, you put him in with four, you visit him first, you discover that you can reach D for a cost of two, so you would update the cost of D to be two and the previous of D to be B. But it doesn't break the algorithm or anything, it just means that you would update, and we did something like that in the one that we had here where sometimes we stored a number and then we found a better number later. Okay. So that, that'd be fine if you did that. Yeah. Right, I think when I described BFS, it's almost like it's somehow parallel, like it looks at all the path one length and all the path two length, but it, doesn't, it has to look at them in an order because it's a sequential algorithm. Conceptually, it looks at them, it kind of moves out by one at a time, but this algorithm is always gonna pull one element off the PQ and look at it, update anything necessary, and then repeat on the PQ again. Yeah, yeah, question. Um, I had a question about the negative weight thing, so why did that not work, slash couldn't we just like Right, those are interesting questions. Uh, why doesn't it work? Uh, let me think. So, I mean, basically what happens is that this algorithm works because, like, I, I talked about this possibility that, like, what if there's a thing here with cost of, like, 15 and it goes to, like, vertex X or whatever, right? Then my algorithm probably will never look at that because it'll do all the other work and it'll pull things out the PQ. It never, it never gets to anything that costs 15 and it finds F and it says, oh, I know I found the cheapest way to reach F because nothing costs 15, you know, I don't have to look at that 15 thing because I found a path that's cheaper than 15 that gets me to F. But what if X had an edge to F that costs like negative 12, then oops, that like offsets the 15. Oops, now I should have looked at the 15. Now I have to look at everything. It kind of blows the efficiency of the algorithm. If it, it basically it would mean I would have to look at every single, I mean, you were kind of asking about what if there's crud over here. The algorithm doesn't have to look at the crud if its weight is too high, but negative edges would break that property. Um, so now, yeah, what you said was, could I just add, like if, if the worst negative edge is negative 12, could I like add 13 to all the edge costs? Uh, I think that you can do that. I think it's just literally the, the thing can't have negative numbers in it. So like, I think that's okay. Um, I think that will fix, I forget, I haven't implemented it that way before, but, but yeah, it's not that you can't do this, it's just that if it's literally a negative number, then, you know, the algorithm will do the wrong stuff. Uh, yeah? So if you were trying to go for like A to X in this situation, wouldn't this algorithm still like search all the other nodes, even though there's only like one node that actually points to X? Yes, if I wanted to go from A to X, I would look at a lot of other stuff before I actually hop to X, even though I can see a way to get there. Because I have to make sure, like, what if there's an edge for cost four here and then an edge for cost one? Or, or I guess I did that backwards, but like, what if it's like four and then two and then one? Oh, that's better than the 15. Or four and then two and then five and then one. That's better than the, so I have to check all those first, just in case one of them has a jump to X. I don't, I can't, I can't like peek ahead and know that, you know. But don't you have that backward knowledge? I mean, I, I do, but I think if you just really think about it, like, knowing that, <laughs> is basically with you know, as much expense and cost as what I'm doing. So it's like, if it's more than like one hop away, I'm gonna just have to like look at the whole graph basically, so. Uh, yeah, question. Yeah, so I was wondering, um, so this seems like um, it's the same as uh, the graph curve that's searching, but why can we distinguish this from the general searching? Or what's the advantage of like shrinking the, uh, the computation cost the main difference between this and breadth first search is breadth first search finds the um, shortest path, the shortest number of edges. This one finds the lowest cost path. So like you could take a lot more edges. I think what I do here is I go, well I change the numbers on the edges, but uh, I'm gonna undo what you told me to do. Uh, so like the shortest path that breadth first search would find would be ADF. But what Dijkstra will find is A, D, G, F, because it's a lower cost. 
So that's a different result, optimized for a different factor, and that's an important difference. You're right that they're very similar otherwise, but what they produce has an important distinction in the output. Yeah. Okay, so sort of back to um, A to B being one, B to D being one, and A to D being two, right? That would make it so that there are two paths to the same goal that have the same cost. Right. One of them is a longer path. Um, because of the way the PQ is implemented, would it, wouldn't it choose the shorter one every time? Because it would always sort of breadth first A to D and check that, add that, and then after that, add A to B. And B. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I hesitate to overstate, like, there might be a way to wiggle it where you don't actually look at something and, like, I'm not sure if it produces the shortest of a so given. What would it take to produce always the shortest path? Yeah, I'd have to think about it, but I think in an example like this, you're totally right that it picks this one versus this longer one because of the way the order in which it uh, looks at things. But I'm not sure if that's a property that I can assume. I mean, look, what I would say is, if you're running Dijkstra's algorithm, what you care about is the total weight. That's what you care about. And if you have to hop one time extra to get that, or five times or a hundred times extra to get that, you do it. So you know, you're know, you saying, well, is it gonna be one hop shorter or longer? Or can I assume this about how short the path is? This isn't for shortness. I don't care about shortness. I mean, sometimes it's nice, to, if all things are equal, maybe I want a shorter one. But like, if I'm doing this, it's because weight is what I want to worry about, you know? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Searching backwards from X, like doing the reverse of the algorithm. Um, because you're saying because there's not very many ways to get here. And yeah, I mean, there, there's lots of different variations of Dijkstra's algorithm. And I think what you'll find is like, if you concoct a graph that has certain properties, you might say, wait a minute, you can just do this, you know? But if you try to write an algorithm that works for every graph, there's all kinds of shape and sizes of graphs. And any kind of little trick like that that you use for one graph will be worse for some other graph. And so like this works for any graph. It's general. It's pretty fast. Um, what's that? Oh, oh, so um, what if there's loops and cycles and stuff in the graph? Um, I think you're okay because there are some cycles in this, aren't there? Yeah. Aren't there cycles in this graph? Yeah, I forget. Yeah, A, D, C, A. So you can have cycles, it's okay. Um, but that would be another thing. Like if you had negative weight edges, you could be like, whoa, you know, <laughs> negative power, you know, and now it cost me. It's, it's like, uh, have you seen that Superman movie where like Lois Lane dies? So he like flies up in space and he spins the earth backwards. And it makes time go backwards, and then she comes back to life, and then he's like, hey. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> so if you like spin around in a graph trying to get negative weight so your path will be better, like it doesn't work that way. Uh, anyway, so um, yeah, I think it's okay if there are, if there are cycles. Uh, take a couple more questions before we're done for the day, yeah. So um, building off sort of starting at X and going backward, couldn't you just like say, okay, well, which, either the starting or the end point, which one has more nodes connected to it, and then choose the one that has less nodes? Oh, from which starting point? Well, I mean, look, there are variations of Dijkstra's algorithm. I, I'm not going to have time to talk about all of them. I mean, there, there is one particular variation that I do want to talk about, like in terms of you guys thinking, well, wait, can I use some intuition about this graph to make Dijkstra better? That's what I'm going to cover first on Friday, which is called A-star, and it uses the, it's called heuristics to kind of guide which paths it looks at first based on some estimates about the graph and about the vertexes and about edges and these kinds of things. So I'll show you a pretty clever optimization that can make this better in terms of what order it looks at stuff. And uh, we'll, we'll do that on Friday. Um, can I show you guys real quick? Uh, I have an animation of this. Can I show you it? I know it's, t it's basically time to go, but um, uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, homework. I'm going to assign this to you. <laughs> so this is from last year, but it's OK. Um, so like, you guys are going to write basically these graph searching algorithms. Um, so like, what's like, here's Middle Earth. It's, you know, the Lord of the Rings or whatever. So if you say like, I'm going to go from Hobbiton to uh, Mount Doom, uh, let me slow it down. Then it, it went too fast. Um, basically it picks, oh, now it's going too slow. <laughs> it basically picks one path and it goes as far that way as possible. See, it goes up that way, oh, nope, that's bad, go back. 
Let's go that way. Ah, I found it, Mount Doom. Oh, I'll go to the Black Gate first. So it picks that way. It just sort of like picks away and goes as far as it can go, you know? If you do a BFS and you run it, it sort of goes, well, who's next on deck? You guys, okay, I'll go you, I'll go you. It, it, yellow is in the queue and green is visited. So it's sort of like visiting nodes a little further, a little further, a little further on each, each fork in the road kind of, you know? <laughs> And eventually it'll find the path to Mount Doom and it'll be the shortest path to Mount Doom. So it probably means they're gonna go this way, right? Cause it's, uh, it'll show me in a second. Uh, there, so it went that way cause that's the shortest. And I think the weights of the edges are like how dangerous it is to go that way. Like how many, <laughs> Eric Roberts made this particular map and he's like, you can't go from South Farthing straight to Isengard, it's crazy. You have to cross the river of Eladun. And I'm like, yeah. Well, that's, that's why I wouldn't go that way. But um, if you use Dijkstra's algorithm, it looks at the cheaper one first. It looks at the 30 before, or that one was cheap, but it looks at the edges that are cheaper before it looks at the edges that are expensive. So I believe this Dijkstra call is gonna give us the lowest total weight path. So that ends up being that way. So it's different than what the BFS produced. This is more likely for a little Frodo and the guy from Stranger Things to make it out in one piece. Uh, anyway, I gotta let you guys go because I'm out of time. We're gonna practice graphs in section. I'll see you guys all on Friday. Thanks.